Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Women's History Month. I'm super excited to see you all here. This is our first time at the Brooklyn Public Library. So thank you so much for your patience, for waiting. We are still expecting some more people, but I hear the weather outside is cold and it's, the traffic is terrible, but I'm sure they'll show up eventually. So that said, uh, how many people here have been to Women in AI Ethics event previously? Just a quick show of hands. Oh, hello. <laughs> good, good. This is exciting. OK, for folks who have been to an event previously, welcome, welcome back. And for those who haven't, I can just say you're in for a great treat. We have some really inspiring chats today. And just by way of introduction, I'm Mia Shadand. I am the founder of Women in AI Ethics. Women in AI Ethics started in 2018 when I published the first list, the 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics list. Some of these women are with us today, and you'll get to meet them in person. Women in AI Ethics, what started with a simple list, now focuses on three core areas. Erasure, we make sure that women's contributions to the space of AI are not erased that we don't acknowledge and include women whenever there are important discussions related to technology, to artificial intelligence. And last but not the least, we focus on ethics. What that means is we elevate the voices of women and diverse folks who are making sure that artificial intelligence is beneficial for all of us and not for a handful of billionaires. So that said, uh, I do want to start introducing you to our speakers today, but before I do that, I have a few housekeeping items for you. One is, uh, just know no food and water is allowed in this space, but we do have water fountains outside. We have water cups. Please grab some uh, whenever you get a chance. We will have five minutes break between each session, so we have three inspiring sessions today for you. So that said, I would also like to make sure that we acknowledge and recognize all the people who made who show up every time to make this event successful because we are donor-sponsored, we are volunteer-led organization. So just a big shout out to all our volunteers who are here today. <laughs> Thank you so much for always showing up, always helping out and making sure our events are successful. Our also, um, I'd like to give a big shout out to Eliana Miller and the team here at Brooklyn Public Library. This is our first event here. And as you can imagine, first events are always a little stressful and you always have a lot to figure out. Uh, but we are getting there. This is one of our, this is our first event, but certainly not our last one. Uh, so let's see, what else? Uh, we also have a, this session will be recorded. So just so you know, we always get this question. You can go to our website, our website at womeninaiethics.org and you can get the recordings there as well. We do have uh, Amal over here who'll be taking some photographs only used for social media on our website. So thank you, Amal, for being here. Uh, we will also have, a Q we will not be doing Q&A, but we do have a networking reception where you'll get to enjoy some delicious treats and drinks from a local restaurant, but you'll also get to meet our speakers in person and ask your questions. So that said, I would like to welcome the first inspiring woman this evening, uh, Linda Johnson, who is the CEO and president of Brooklyn Public Library. Welcome. As we get started, I have a quick question for you all. How many people have been in the space before? Brooklyn Public Library, you have been here before? Amazing, okay. In this Dweck Auditorium, this is my first time. The last time we came, it was all dark. That was my first time here, so I'm super excited. Uh, I love public libraries, and it's personal. I'm an immigrant, single working mother, and my child practically grew up in a public library. 
And I'm not the only one. There are so many women that I know who have shared their stories. We have volunteers who also tell us about how their moms used to just, parents used to drop them off at a public library after school. This was their after school care. So I so appreciate the fact that we are getting to host our event in this amazing space with all these amazing women. So thank you for having us. Well, it's a pleasure and it's unusual for me to be sitting in this seat. Usually I'm sitting in that seat. Um, I'm not usually the guest in my own home. Um, but I'm very happy that you're all here tonight and we all love, um, all of us at the library, love to hear everyone else's library stories because there are myriad stories that people have about how the library figured into their lives and probably no more significantly than you know some of our newest neighbors um, who have immigrated here recently and uh, sort of use the library as a place to figure out where to go next and what the resources are that are, might be available to them. And so especially these days, we're doing a lot of work um, in the neighborhoods in Brooklyn where there are a lot of new immigrants. That's fantastic. Libraries offer so much. It's not just free books, it's free resources, free programming, it's free Wi-Fi. Like, the list just keeps going on. Can you share a little bit about what is the mission of the library in the AI age? Because AI is everywhere. We're all talking about it. Have you seen? Uh... Um, so the interesting thing is that the public library movement started over 125 years ago with the Carnegie Compact. and. The idea has really not changed. It's just that as the way we consume information becomes more complicated, the mission of the library also becomes more uh, complicated. So 125 years ago, the notion was that affluent people had libraries in their own homes, but less fortunate people didn't, and everybody needed access to the world's knowledge and what was being written. And so libraries were designed, um, they're Carnegie libraries, that's what we call them. We have. Um, uh, 18 of them here in Brooklyn. Um, but the idea was, um, you know, to level the playing field so that everybody had access. And, uh, but it was always about going to the library, borrowing a book in English, in hard copy, and taking it home or sitting in what was a carol. I don't know if that um, dates me, but we, there were carols in libraries, and that's where you read by yourself. Um, so fast forward 125 years and you can come to the library to do the very same thing. Only the thing today that's leveling the playing field is um, access to the web. And uh, it's also become a place where we're providing services in over 30 languages, where you can read a book on the platform that you're most comfortable. Um, and you can actually listen to books. You know, we have a whole um, digital collection that you can access from home. And so we have, in addition to our 62 branches, uh, a 63rd portal, which is our digital portal. And so some people are using the libraries without even coming to them, which poses a whole new set of problems. We don't want to create an institution where um, the more affluent people are using the library from home and more, um, you know, uh, uh, challenged communities are the ones who are coming in because the beauty of a library is that you are walking into a space where your neighbors live and it's across all generations and backgrounds and if we lose that um, we've lost some of the magic so instead of really kind of monitoring and we, believe me we monitor every metric but instead of monitoring exclusively the circulation of books um, we're now also paying very close attention to program attendance. And so last year we offered over 70,000 programs that were attended by over a million people. Well, a million attendees, the same person might be attending more than one program. Now a program can be story time on a rug in a library with a few kids and their caregivers, or it can be an event like this, or it can be an event like with a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and 600 people up in the lobby. So it crosses a big span, but you get the idea. The idea is that people should be coming to the library, not just um, to visit a repository of information and books, but actually to come and learn what they want to learn, whether it's English as a second language, uh, resume help, workforce development. Um, we're, doing, we're doing everything that is related to literacy, and then I'll be quiet. Literacy is just much more broadly defined these days than it was 125 years ago. Indeed. 
So one thing we did do this year is we, we launched an AI literacy program in partnership with the Brooklyn Public Librarians, uh, which we offered um, at no cost to a lot of students and who are interested in the communities and of all ages. And the response has been so incredibly positive because there's so much information in, about AI in the news, but there's still people have questions and they need someone to go to and understand that. So ha have, how have you seen the community needs evolve as you're seeing, like are you seeing more people asking questions about these new technologies? Like what are you hearing from the yeah. community? So the trick for the library is never to sort of be out on the bleeding edge of technology, putting a stake in the ground before it's clear where the standard might go. Um, because A, we don't have the money to do that and B, you take a big risk when you do that. So AI, you know, has really been around us for a much longer time than people, I think, recognize. Or, uh, it's, uh, it's approached with suspicion by librarians. I think there's a, a sort of deep-seated, uh, um, I don't know, skepticism about it. I think there's some fear around it. But the truth is there's sort of two sides to it. One is how the library as an institution uses AI to do business. And that we're going to continue to do because we're going to be smart about the way we do business, and we're always facing budget cuts and trying to figure out how to be efficient. Um, and it's incredible, AI, right? The way that it can manage large data sets and what it can do for your work. And as I said, librarians are a little skeptical about it. But the other piece of it is really the more interesting piece, which is where should we be with respect to our patrons, and how should we start to introduce programs like yours um, about artificial intelligence so that our communities can begin to understand it and have a place to go to learn what they want to learn and how it might affect their lives and their work uh, because it will do all of that eventually. So not everybody is a fan of libraries as you, we are hearing that they, they do a lot of good, but at the same time, there are a lot of challenges ahead of for libraries. Can you talk to us about some of the challenges that you're facing? Well, I don't know about the, uh, about the assumption. I thought everybody loved libraries. It was a little I'm bit mistake. like... I was mistaken. <laughs> everybody a little bit like motherhood and apple pie. Um, not everybody uses them, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody say anything bad about a library. Although, one of the biggest programs that we are running now is something that's not so much in Brooklyn, but rather um, we provide access, digital access, to um, people between the ages of 13 and 21 all over the country who are living in places where they can't find the books on the shelves of their school or their public library that they want to read, typically books about LBGTQ plus issues or um, critical race theory. Um, but the challenges that libraries face is that they are largely municipally funded and um, we're facing budget cuts. And so uh, there's always a budget negotiation that goes on every year. It just began. It will it will be um, concluded by the end of June by law. It has to be uh, the the city's budget has to um, be announced by the end of June 30th. So the fiscal year begins July 1st, um, and it's always a struggle. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's a struggle. I think more than any other reason that the it's something that the citizenry fights for. And we've, over the years, done a good job um, building advocacy campaigns. Uh, so it becomes part of a dance. And um, we're in it. <laughs> That's all I can say. And I'm, um, I'm hoping that things are better than they look right now. The first, um, the first iteration of the budget wasn't pretty. So we're hoping for a, a progress, I'll say. And you know we're all rooting for you. Yes, you have to sign letters to your elected officials. We'll make sure that you have all the information you need to do that. Indeed, we'll be there <laughs> to support you. Uh, a big part of our mission is to avoid the, the digital divide, turning into the AI divide, because that's, those conversations are happening at all levels, whether it's government, globally, even state and citywide. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you've been addressing the digital divide for a long time. Yeah. Where do you see the themes, the commonalities between AI divide and the digital divide? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all the same thing, right? I, I, the digital divide is a terrible thing. It was always a terrible thing, and we in the library knew that um, anybody who was on the wrong side of the digital div divide really faced uphill challenges just in terms of their day-to-day -day existence in this city. It's a complicated place, and so much information is available 
online. But then I think with the um, you know pandemic, even people who weren't so in tune with what was going on in some of the communities where you know over 30% of the households don't have um, internet access. I think people began to realize when they saw the challenges in their own homes about what it was to have two people working and maybe two people going to school and not having adequate internet access, it all of a sudden became something that was in people's consciousness. When we shut down, um, we intentionally left the internet signals in all of our buildings on because even when before the pandemic, on a nice night in June, people would sit outside our buildings and take advantage of the signal that was seeping out. And so we had a feeling that this was going to happen, um, you know, when people weren't allowed in the building at all. And, and we monitored the number of Wi-Fi sessions, and it was extraordinary. So we said, well, we're not doing enough. And I don't want anyone in this room to think that I believe this was a solution, but it was a Band-Aid, right? Your kid was only in third grade that one year. And so we, built, we, we raised money and we put antenna on the roofs of our libraries, every one, and extended the signal out another 300 feet in every direction, which doesn't sound all that much, but in fact, in some neighborhoods, especially where there's public housing, um, that's a significant extension of signal. And so that was our sort of way of trying to help people uh, on the wrong side of the digital divide. But as I say, it's not the solution. Um, it was just a Band-Aid in the moment. Um, and I think that you know AI is just one more step in this sort of um, spectrum that that we call the digital divide. It's just with each new thing that comes along, and this will be the next thing. If right now we are leveling the playing field by increasing um, you know access to the web, the next thing will be AI, maybe, or you know who knows what comes after that. It, there will always be this imbalance that the library will be there to try and, you know, right size. Again, I can't appreciate how much value that libraries bring to the communities because I know personally so many women who talked about not having access, they don't want to work at home because the Wi-Fi connectivity is not strong. They sit in the parking lots too of public libraries yeah. to get access. And the number are, are just terrible, like 40 million households who don't have access to high-speed internet. And I'm talking about United States right here. And so- It's crazy. And the, the problem, I mean, here the, it's an urban problem and it's one of money. It's too expensive. And actually the other thing we've been doing since the pandemic you know, there are affordable programs out there. You just need to have a PhD in order to figure out how to, you know, take advantage of them. And one of the things that they require is that you be online to register. So the reason you're qualified for this low-cost internet access is because you don't have the ability to go online. So we have gone out, and most of the work we do, we do for large, you know, numbers of people, and we, we brag about it. You know, this many people uh, came to the library this year, this many people visited this branch, over a million one people come to this branch every year. And then we decided, well, we need to sort of change the way we think about things when it comes to the digital divide. And so now we're sending navigators out into neighborhoods through the branch systems and trying to help people register and take advantage of these um, offerings that are out there. You know, obviously, the providers are not spending a ton of money marketing programs that are $20 a month, but they are there. These conversations matter so much because there's so much we take for granted. Yeah. Like there's so many of us just think, yeah, Wi-Fi is always there, internet is always there, you, we'll you always have access. Phone. How many times a day are you online? Indeed, indeed. Uh, now, artificial intelligence, again, we keep coming back to that very simply because it's what consumes us these days because so many of us work in this field or we are hearing about in today's topic is artificial intelligence. Uh, we do have another event coming up next week. We'll talk more details about deep fakes and uh, disinformation, how AI is used for not for good purposes. Uh, can you talk about some solutions that you might be exploring or thinking about how do we keep our community safe from, say, the downsides of artificial intelligence? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's on the web, too. I, I wish I, I knew the answer. Um, I think that librarians are trusted, libraries are trusted places, um, and it is all about trust. and. Um, I, I think that it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we maintain that position in our communities so that people do feel that when they come to the library that somebody who is advising them is giving them good information. And I think that sort of given what's happening 
online and in the press and on television, um, it's more important than ever that people have a source of uh, information that they that they do trust. And I don't know, it kind of hurts my heart um, what's going on in this area. Uh, and I, I wish I had a great answer for how to fix it, but um, I think all we can do is just our best to uh, continue to earn the trust of our communities. I feel like that is such a critical piece. It doesn't matter, technologies come and go, that's always been my perspective, having been in tech for a while. But just the fact that libraries are here, yeah. they're legitimate, they're credible sources of information and the resources, that just means a lot to our community. So I do appreciate a lot for to have this conversation. And we are doing our part, bridging the divide, bringing more people into our libraries, trying to raise awareness, bringing amazing women um, who are joining us today to talk about artificial intelligence and talk about more about how we can start making more people smarter about what's happening in these communities to reduce that divide a little bit. Um, so in just parting, we have two more minutes. I just want to ask you, like, what would you leave this audience with? What would you like them to do? What steps can they take to make sure that our communities stay safe and have access to these amazing resources you provide? Well, I mean, the fact that you're here, I think, first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing and for choosing um, this venue to hold this event. Um, but I think the fact that all of you in the audience are here means you're already way more informed about uh, what's happening in the world of artificial intelligence than most. And um, if you have the inclination, there are plenty of ways that you can volunteer. We have over 2,000 volunteers here, and wherever you may live, I'm sure there are opportunities for you to share um, your expertise and your experience um, with others who are just learning. So um, if you're inclined, I know a good way to give back. Yeah, and we will take you up on that. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for hosting us Thank in this you. beautiful space. Thank you. Thank you.